The Atari 2600 was the most popular home video game console of the second generation. Originally released on September 11th, 1977, as the Atari Video Computer System, or alternately, the Sears Video Arcade, this plastic and faux wood panel box would come to define video games for Generation X. This four switch variation came out in 1980, but it will serve our purposes. <laughs> Isn't this the console the Griswolds drove to Wally World? On the front is the cartridge slot, power switch, black and white or color toggle. All right, some explanation. Black and white TVs were still pretty common in 1977. What looks good in color might not have good contrast in grayscale. This switch allowed the 2600 to have full backwards compatibility. Man, the 70s were like a totally different time. Up next, the gain level switch, no need for cheat codes here, and reset switch, which is what was used to start most games. I guess the pause button on the Sega Master System makes a little more sense now. On the back are the left and right controller ports, AB difficulty switches for both ports, which used to be lever switches on the front of the Sixer models, and those broke all the time, so no wonder they were moved. The AC adapter input, the RF output, and channel 2 to channel 3 selector, which only became standard with this 4 switch model. Some modern CRT TVs don't even let you tune to channel 2 anymore, so you better hope that channel 3 is clear, which isn't a guarantee, even in this post-analog TV world. But what's up with this RF cable? It's built in and... No. No. No, 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 no! Oh, thank you. You are likely going to need some kind of adapter for the built-in RF cable. The typical adapter from 40 years ago looked something like this, which had an RCA input. Oh man, it even worked with rabbit ears. Back in the 80s, I had to use an adapter like this one for my NES. You may even be able to use a mail-to-mail -mail bridge with one of your other console's RF adapters. Any of these items can be picked up at stores like Radio Shack, uh, assuming you still have one where you live. But how do I get this on my HDTV? Here's what you'll need. Atari's CX-10 and later CX-40 joysticks became the standard bearer for video game controllers. Its form was emulated by both Atari's console and home computer contemporaries, such as the Sega SG-1000, Apple II, and others. The joystick is designed to be controlled by the right hand and the single action button pushed by the thumb of your left, a reversal of the typical arcade experience. A common problem with these controllers was the lack of feedback, such as clicking noises on the buttons, and the variance in the force required for the joystick to register in any particular direction. Despite this, some companies were so hesitant to leap behind joysticks and to enter Nintendo's D-pad world that the Sega Master System even came with optional thumbsticks. Just one button, though. How do you do anything? I just got a copy of Smurf. It doesn't even use the button. How are you supposed to jump? Oh, you push up. Apparently. Some games required paddles to use, such as Super Breakout. Warlords. And Breakout, which was released after Super Breakout. It's confusing. One pair of paddles plugs into a single controller port, which means that games like Warlords could support up to four players. But which port do you plug into for only one player? I mean, you always use left for player one, right? Left. Right. What? As it turns out, some games explicitly use the right port and only the right port. Fortunately, this game should say so on the label, assuming your cartridge still has one. What's actually really cool about these controller ports is that they're a standard serial configuration, which was used by a bunch of other consoles. Speaking of the Sega Master System, yep, works fine. There are two buttons, but only button one is wired up. Genesis? You betcha. The B button is the trigger. This Hudson B controller for the MSX that looks like it belongs to the Famicom? Yeah. Well, mostly. One is the trigger button, but two does something weird. So, if you're not a fan of joysticks, or having a hard time finding any that are still in one piece 40 years later, you can use these controllers from other systems without much fuss. But if you really want to go old school, special shout out to the RetroBit controller for providing a satisfying, clicky feedback experience. Oh, baby. 
However, the greatest strength of any game system is, of course, the games. The most popular on the Atari 2600 by far was Pac-Man, which sold 7 million copies over the life of the console and was included as a pack-in, and at the time was the best-selling video game of any kind. So it must be pretty amazing, right? Okay, look, the 70s were like this whole different time. I said that already. ROM chips were way more expensive 40 years ago, which means only as many kilobytes as you can count on one hand were available to make an entire game. A lot of what is now considered standard sprite management was created during this time in video game history. That's why some games look so blocky, because you only need two sets of XY coordinates and another number for color to represent a rectangle on the screen. But necessity is the mother of invention, and some games made really great use of the 2600's technical limitations. Others, not so much. After the video game crash, when gamers made it clear they would not tolerate subpar titles any longer, <laughs> and competition was on the rise. <laughs> Tell that to Back to the Future fans. Programmers had more time, resources, and knowledge to really take advantage of the aging 2600 hardware. Man, does that sprite have two different colors? Oh, so advanced. The 2600 continued to sell well into the third generation of video games, making it, at the time, the longest lived console ever when it was discontinued in 1992, outlasting even its two immediate successors. In fact, the release of the Atari 5200, and later the 7800, is what prompted the name change from VCS to the 2600 in 1982. This was the production number of the original VCS console, and it was reflected in the numbering of Atari's self-published titles, but this Atari 2600 branding was what came to be stamped all over its subsequent games. This was an important distinction, as the unwieldy 5200 didn't support backwards compatibility. This name change also came with a new console design, which ditched the 70s style wood paneling for an all-black look and featured the 2600 logo. And in case the 77 and 80 models seemed conspicuously like Star Wars dates, this new model was dubbed Darth Vader by fans and was released in 1982. Eh, close enough. 83. No, man, 82. Would Wikipedia lie to me? Okay, let's just agree that it was post-Empire, but pre-Teddy Bears with Rocks movie. It was during this time, when Nintendo was still developing the family computer, and even after its release, that the Atari 2600 saw a number of Nintendo arcade ports. But that is another story entirely. What are you? Famicom Dojo.